speak about the Preston model, which is something I've been uh, deeply involved with, um, as Sarah said, since 2012. What I'm going to do is give a, a brief overview. I, I may speak for 20 minutes as opposed to 15. No, that's OK. Yeah, I'll try oh, sorry, to that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Brief as fast as I can. Um, so um, let's just begin by a little bit of context. Um, because the Preston model is a place-based um, project, um, I think it's important to emphasize that what's good, the detail of what's good for the Preston model and for Preston is um, good in different degrees and different qualities according to each different place, um, because not every place is like Preston. Um, and in Preston, um, the industrial past, the cotton mills of Preston, and you can see the uh, early 20th century images there of uh, Preston, uh, the Preston cotton mills, um, the industrial past of Preston is uh, really important. And um, I think, in my opinion, um, the industrial past of Preston had created a sense of community, which um, still exists today, even though that um, industrial uh time in preston has completely disappeared all the all the industries related to the cotton industry have completely disappeared but um what has remained in preston um i think is a sense of um community uh, which was um generated by that kind of industrial past so each place will have a different kind of um generation of community and i think the identification of what it is that creates that community i think is an essential part of developing community wealth building uh, so in mondragon for example uh, if any of you are aware of the um, cooperative ecosystem in uh, mondragon in the basque country in the north of spain um, they uh, were bound together by uh, religion really by Catholic social action. So uh, the religious community in, in Mondragon, um, coupled with the historical um, attachment to the land, which is part of the Basque culture, that, that is the kind of thing that uh, holds the community in uh, Mondragon together. So different places have different ways of um, holding community. Now, the context since 2008, of course, uh, very recent, is that in the UK at least, um, and of course I can't speak for Australia, in the UK at least, uh, we've had um, a very difficult time of it, particularly in the north of England. Uh, traditionally in England, uh, all the wealth is uh, situated, is located in the south of England, uh, in particular the southeast of England, and in particular uh, in London. Uh, and for many, many years, there's been a, a, a lack of balance uh, in the distribution of wealth around uh, England. A huge amounts of public money have been uh, pumped into the financial system. We've had uh, austerity measures uh, continuously, practically since 2008. Um, investment is very weak. Uh, we've had growing inequality and lowering standards of living um, and even, um, and this is what we, we think in Preston, signs of a systemic failure of uh, traditional methods of urban uh, regeneration. And this is typified in Preston by uh, this example um, in 2011. Uh, a huge, well, huge in, uh, for Preston, a huge um, regeneration scheme for Preston called the Tithe Barn Project, which consisted of uh, major department stores uh, agreeing to open up in Preston, um, the flattening of a certain area of Preston and the rebuilding of it, just as you can see here in the artist's impression, uh, rooftop gardens, um, escalators, uh, fancy shops, um, pedestrian walkways, uh, 700 million pounds to be generated into that project. Well, in 2011, this um, external investment into Preston uh, collapsed. Um, it collapsed, of course, as a result of the, uh, the crisis from 2008 onwards. And um, as a result of that, Preston was left um, in, in terms of traditional systems, uh, Preston was left with uh, 
this, an absolute vacuum. And it was uh, quite a desperate time, really, because the Tithe Barn project, the Inward Investment Project, had been developing for many years. And once that collapsed, it appeared to us in Preston that uh, there was nothing left. So um, really, um, many places, I think, uh, faced with that would have been um, despairing or would have tried to find some more external investment uh, to replace the uh, investment that had failed. But um, in Preston, um, we had a sort of connection of uh, different people thinking in the same way, um, maybe by chance. It's difficult to know why uh, those people and those institutions got together. But in particular, um, there was a sort of synergy between the council and the university, um, which started to generate uh, some new ideas. So the basic idea was faced with a vacuum, faced with a disaster, faced with the failure of the investment system, what uh, could we do in Preston to improve matters? So um, the university, uh, and this is you know where my experience from Mondragon comes in because um, before uh, becoming an academic at the university, I was an organizational consultant and I did a lot of work in Mondragon and in Spain. <laughs> Um, and I brought that knowledge into the university uh, from an academic and a research perspective and invited uh, Mikhail Lithamith from the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation in 2013 to speak um, both to the university, to the staff, to the students, but also to create a series of public lectures um, about um, the Mondragon system and what they do there to uh, work cooperatively and to create a whole ecosystem of cooperation. So Mikhail came over to uh, the university and gave a series of public talks. And it was at uh, one of these public talks that I met uh, Councillor Matthew Brown. Um, and we've been working together uh, and making a, a partnership between the university and the council, um, working together to uh, create uh, what now is known as the Preston model. Um, we're particularly interested in Mondragon because um, many people in the UK, and once again, I don't know what it's like in Australia, um, but many people in the UK um, have very little idea of what constitutes a cooperative and many prejudices and uh, fallacies uh, related to uh, cooperation. Um, so what interested us about the Mondragon system was that it was a big system. It was a, a very much uh, a wealth generating system and it was uh, full of worker owned cooperatives. Um, and the way those worker owned cooperatives worked was in a, in a truly participatory and democratic fashion, but not small scale. So in the UK, um, there's this idea that a cooperative is basically um, perhaps your local organic grocer, for example, with uh, two or three people running uh, an ethically sound organic grocer, for example. But what we're interested in in Preston is of course, that's fine. That's okay, and uh, you know that we we would support all sorts of cooperatives, whatever they are. But what we we're interested in doing was to um, under um, help people understand that cooperatives could be a completely alternative form of business for an entire um, economic and social fabric, uh, rather than a few cooperatives dotted here and there. So we were commissioned um, by the by Preston City Council to um, provide a scoping study of cooperative activity in Preston, and this uh, this uh, report was published um, for Preston City Council, and Preston City Council um, accepted all the recommendations of the report. Um, and in many ways, it was the report and the acceptance of the recommendations of the report that began the uh, process of creating a cooperative culture uh, in Preston. And what I'm trying to emphasize here is 
the working together of institutions. In this case, uh, the uh, council, Preston City Council and the University of Central Lancashire working together and providing mutual benefits in that work. So the Preston Cooperative Development Network was uh, founded soon after the uh, report was presented to the council and uh, the reasons for its being founded was of course that um, one of the recommendations of the report was precisely to create a development network of cooperatives which in a sort of loose fashion um, was based on the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation uh, as a cooperative of cooperatives, a cooperative that would uh, link together and bring membership of uh, different people and different cooperatives and social enterprises even who are interested in cooperation and interested in being networked and um, providing mutual support. So that was founded uh, and I became chair of that in the first uh, few years. So one of the important strands of the present model then um, is indeed the development of cooperatives. But I think one of the things that um, is really important and um, if you like is uh, essential to the whole idea of the Preston model is that it consists of lots of different aspects that are joined together in a sort of jigsaw fashion. So um, the fact that there are cooperatives in itself is not um, uh, the Preston model, it's simply part of the Preston model. Um, and another very important aspect of the Preston model is the changing of procurement habits in anchor institutions. So by anchor institutions, of course, um, as many of you will be aware, uh, we're talking about in big institutions that, in the case of Preston, are rooted in Preston. Uh, they're institutions that are major employers, they're major spenders, uh, they have a big turnover of uh, wealth, um, they provide services to the community, so they have a, a, an aspect of um, community service about them. Um, and because they're uh, such big institutions and because they're so essential to the place um, they're not going anywhere um, even if um, austerity strikes even if we have um, terrible situations that that occur and we have our fair share of those things these days even in um, bad times those anchor institutions are what the name says they're anchored they're rooted they're anchored they're not going to go anywhere so um, they're reliable um, if you like, spenders or generators of wealth uh, for Preston, unlike the uh, example of the Tithe Barn project that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, where uh, footloose um, corporations and uh, big retail stores, uh, they might come and they might go, um, but uh, anchor institutions are, are here to stay. Um, so we thought it was important that if those anchor institutions are there to stay, if they have uh, some aspect of community service about them, such as, for example, the hospital, the police, the uh, higher education, the further education centres, you, the university is one of them, um, the council itself, if those uh, places were going to stay, then if they could be persuaded to spend more money locally and if they could be persuaded to improve um, their uh, employment practices then this would be of enormous uh, wealth benefit to um, the community in Preston. Uh, a, a lot of people uh, said to us from the very beginning that this is not possible, it can't be done, it's illegal uh, and so on and so forth. So we were forced to get some legal advice um, and we were able to demonstrate to the procurement officers and the finance officers of the anchor institutions that there was a lot that they could do to spend more money, to buy more uh, products um, from the local area, if not the local uh, Preston area, uh, slightly beyond Preston, Greater Preston or, or the northwest uh, of England, there was a lot they could do to, to uh, actually change their procurement habits. And 
um, interestingly, a lot of those procurement officers, they were unaware of the details of the law um, and uh, a lot of them thought it wasn't even going to be possible. So um, it's quite important, of course, in Australia to be completely different laws, um, but it's quite important, obviously, to uh, understand what you can and what you can't do. And very often you can do more than you think. So the result of this uh, is that um, it led to major changes in the procurement habits of anchor institutions with the, um, the managers of these institutions um, able to attend more to social value and able to increase uh, the generation of local wealth and able to retain uh, local wealth uh, in quite a, quite a dramatic way. Um, as you can see on the slide there, uh, at least 500, uh, 540 million pounds uh, re-localized into uh, the Preston area. So all of that money is uh, wealth that um, before 2012, that wealth um, went outside Preston. Um, so what have they, what have the anchor institutions been doing? So instead of um, purchasing uh, goods and products from uh, different global corporations, many of which are located in London or the southeast of England, um, they began a policy of trying to find um, these same goods and products uh, nearer to home, nearer to Preston. Um, and they found they could do that with surprising success. Of course, what they had to do was change some of the ways they were working. So if, as an example, if um, a big anchor institution uh, has a big estates uh, policy and everything on the estate is, is bundled into one giant contract, then what that means is that uh, smaller uh, businesses uh, in the local area are unable to compete for that big, massive uh, estates and facilities contract. Um, but what we said to the anchor institutions is, hey, you don't have to have this massive contract. What you can do is you can take your habit of having been uh, a giant uh, policy on, on estates and you can chop it up. You can chop it up into little bits. So, for example, you could have a local company um, attending to the repair of windows and doors. OK, doors and windows contract, um, as opposed to having that in a giant contract. And suddenly the opposite happens. If you've got a tiny contract for repairing windows and doors, then the global corporations suddenly are not interested, but the local businesses are interested. And so in a perfectly legal way, um, simply by changing the nature of the, uh, the tender, uh, you can generate um, higher competition and better success locally uh, compared to um, previously. So interestingly enough, um, this is about uh, economic wealth generation, but also, and I think this is a key as well, it's also about what people feel. Uh, it's about um, encouraging community spirit. It's about um, giving people a motivation for understanding what it's like to live in a place like Preston. It's about giving uh, people a sense of belonging and identity. Um, and from you've got three different uh, comments here from uh, people involved in three different anchor institutions uh, that demonstrate that employment, living conditions impact their health, accessibility, contextualizing economic growth. It's a, a really important holistic way of, of doing things. Um, most people are proud of the model. A lot of people said they were proud, proud of being impressed and suddenly proud of uh, the model and what they're doing for communities. And the point being made here is that it's not about shareholder value. It's not about shareholders. It's about the value, the social value to communities and in Preston. It's, what about, it's about what people uh, can get out of this, not uh, the wealth going away to some uh, tax haven somewhere, but the wealth being uh, retained within the local area 
um, sharing good practice for our community. Uh, here's someone who talks about as someone being born in Preston, uh, it's been a great thing. So it's really, really important to understand that um, it's got to go deeper than the, me the mere economics. It's much more than finance. It's about what people feel, it's about what people want to do, it's about their identity, it's about empowerment, it's about agency, it's about democratic practice and participation, it's about all of those things as well. And it's the spirit of those things that has helped the, to move the model along. Um, because of course, uh, it hasn't all been plain sailing, it's very really quite difficult to do some of these things. And in the difficult moments, it's the spirit that has carried it uh, along and helped to sustain it. Now, apart from the direct effect of community wealth building, the generation and the retention of community wealth, which we've just seen, a huge amount of um, wealth, financial wealth retained in the Preston region, there are other very encouraging signs in Preston. Now, it's very difficult from a, uh, if you like, from an academic perspective, from the, the angle that I take, it's very difficult to say that these things are cause and effect, that the Preston model caused these things. Um, uh, but it would be quite extraordinary if um, these different measures of well-being, for example, in a place like Preston, um, were not connected to the Preston model. Um, so what we've seen is uh, since 2017, uh, more or less, we've seen a whole series of um, reports, uh, surveys, uh, measurements, assessments, evaluations from different uh, organisations, Pricewaterhouse, Cooper here, uh, discussing the improvement of Preston, most improved city, highest performing northwest city, uh, and so on and so forth, in a in a consistent way, year after year. Uh, and along with these, there are other indices as well, such as um, there's a so-called happiness uh, index, and uh, Preston is right up there uh, at the top. And although I can't say, look, the Preston model did it, um, it seems like an extraordinary coincidence, and I think that we'd be, uh, uh, we wouldn't be too far in error to suggest that uh, the Preston model is connected with these uh, improvements in the area. Um, and there are other other significant improvements. Uh, the uh, unemployment rate is significantly uh, reduced. Uh, there's more business activity than ever before. And um, there's employment growth in Preston, uh, greater employment growth than uh, most other places in the UK. Uh, and as, as before, you, you can't Hello? say this is Hello? because of that, but it would be incredible if it had nothing to do with it. Hello? Russell, can you take, sorry about this, Jolene. Russell, can you go on mute? Thank you. Um, sorry, Jolene, continue. Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the idea of towards a model, um, I think it's important as well to understand that when we began in 2011, 2012, um, there was no model. I mean, everyone talks about the Preston model now, but of course it, it wasn't a model to begin with. It was basically doing what we could in difficult circumstances. And it wasn't us who said Preston model, it was uh, some media uh organization that suddenly called it the preston model so i mean it's important to understand that um you know we didn't sort of set out with this fantastic uh mm. blueprint for a model uh which we now have um it sort of grew organically um and uh that might sound that might sound a bit ad hoc but actually that's one of its strengths because it grew organically it grew roots up and so people were able to contribute to how it grew, and therefore people were able to uh, have a real say in what it was. Instead of instead of someone saying to them, "Look, this is a model. You adopt this." Uh, what we did is we sort of by just talking and participating, we developed it all together, and the model uh, looks something 
like this, uh, you've got uh, the city of Preston right in the middle and right around it, you've got different aspects of this kind of jigsaw. Uh, so you've had the anchor institutions, which we've already mentioned. Uh, we've got the Preston Cooperative Development Network. We have Preston City Council. Uh, you have the university, this uh, essential um, partnership between the university and the council. Um, and then uh, recently, I'm going to talk about these in a minute, we have the, um, the foundation, the creation of the Preston Cooperative Education Centre um, and the Northwest Mutual Community and Cooperative Bank. So the education centre and the bank are essential parts of um, this whole jigsaw. The Preston Cooperative Education Centre uh, aspires one day to be a branch of the Federated Cooperative University, which will um, have branches all over uh, the UK. So these are the two things we're working on right now in particular. On the one hand, the Preston Cooperative Education Centre, and this is inspired by the example of Mondragon. Uh, some of you will know that uh, the ecosystem in Mondragon was 13 years in the making before the first cooperative came to being. And those 13 years were 13 years of education. So the founder of Mondragon, Father Jose Maria Arizmendi Areta, founded the Technical Education College in Mondragon, which ran for 13 years before the first co-op was uh, created. And the reason for that is as true of Mondragon as it is for Preston, and I would say as it is of anywhere else, um, it's no good supposing or uh, imagining that people will suddenly jump onto the ship and say, oh, great, let's do a few cooperatives. Um, a lot of people in Preston had no idea what cooperatives were or had a skewed idea of cooperatives. Um, and a lot of people in Preston took it for granted that uh, a very hardline neoliberal uh, approach to the economy was the only thing to do. And so in order to change the way people think, um, we do need to educate and we do need to uh, exchange and interchange educational ideas about what cooperation is and what uh, an ecosystem for Preston might be like. So that's why we set up in 2021 last year, the Preston Cooperative Education Centre. And in 18 months time, we'll have the first branch of the Northwest Community and Cooperative Bank opening its doors in Preston, which is something we're immensely proud of. Uh, the reason for the bank, of course, is if we're serious about cooperatives, cooperative businesses increasing and getting bigger and being a major part of the economy, then they need money. And we know that the high street banks won't lend them money. And so the only thing uh, we can think of, once again, um, inspired by Mondragon, uh, Mondragon's cooperative bank, Laboral Kucha, which uh, was used to be called Caja Laboral, uh, we've created this bank. And so the bank will uh, be a cooperative itself, will be owned by its users, um, and it will lend money um, and support the development of um, cooperatives in ways that the uh, high street banks, the big banks, won't do. We have a project committee because it's important to continue generating the ideas. We have a project committee uh, at PrestonModel.net. You can find that. And if you want, you can download a couple of important reports that were uh, created by the uh, Preston Model Committee uh, in collaboration with LKS Mondragon, uh, training and consultancy service from Mondragon, uh, helped um, a group of us to uh, create these two reports. One of them uh, is an ana analysis of the latest developments of uh, entrepreneurial initiatives in the Basque country. Uh, and the other one is specifically a four year strategic plan for the development of cooperative entrepreneurship initiatives uh, in Preston. And those are freely available to download at prestonmodel.net if, you, if you're interested. So um, what have we learned? So these, we've learned a lot of things and of course we're still learning but um, some of the major learning outcomes for us are the need for specialist change makers. For example, um, it could be the university, it could be a think tank, uh, whatever uh, 
the change makers are, uh, the recognized experts are in any particular area. And what they need to do, these change makers, they need to help join the dots and they need to help uh, innovation and creating solutions. Um, they need to provide evidence for change because uh, a lot of people won't be convinced until there's a little bit of evidence. And they need to provide strategy and policy, uh, which needs to be combined with uh, behavior change and cultural change. So the cultural change uh, is what we're developing with the Preston Cooperative Education Centre. Um, you need a political, strategic and community buy-in. Um, all of those, not, not just one of them. It's no good having the community buy-in if you don't have a political buy-in. And it's no good having a political buy-in if you don't have a community buy-in. Um, of course, you can always make progress. But the important thing about the uh, success of the model is how all of these things are interconnected and mutually supporting, um, really fundamental. Um, the fact that it's more than economics, uh, procurement can drive social change and cultures can change, even in very bureaucratic uh, sur surroundings. Um, so it's important to sort of believe it, to believe that um, those people who've been working for 20 years in procurement and have never changed their habits, it's important to believe that yes, they can. Yes, they can change their habits. Uh, and the reason they change their habits is because they're human beings and because they live in Preston and because they want to make it happen. They want to make it work. You know, uh, very often, uh, I think institutions are, are sort of uh, approached as if they were just uh, robotic, um, faceless organizations. But uh, we need to remember that these institutions are crammed full of human beings like you and me and um, they're able to change their culture and they're able to desire better uh, for the places that they, they live in and for the future of their children and so on and so forth. Um, the creation of networks, absolutely fundamental. Now, if you create um, 10 co-ops for a local area, but those co-ops, instead of cooperating, are competing against each other, then basically you've shot yourself in the foot. Um, those cooperatives need to um, adhere to the principles of cooperation, one of which is intercooperation, cooperatives mutually supporting each other. So creating a network of, uh, of cooperatives or like-minded people, however you want to do it, creating a network that works for the place is really important. Um, and a vision. Um, a vision is important and people love a vision. People, people want to buy into this because when you say you want to cooperate, you want to participate, you want people to be democratic, you want people to believe in, in sharing and democratic governance um, and that we believe in cooperation for the community. Actually, those things aren't radical at all. Those things are things that people can buy into very easily and they want it. People want that. Uh, and we always talk about this in terms of common sense. Who wouldn't want cooperation? Who wouldn't want to participate? Who wouldn't want to uh, have a fair and equal democratic society? Uh, and once you approach it in, from a common sense perspective like that, um, people suddenly say, yeah, that's right. We want that. We want to join in. So, um, you know, a couple of books. Uh, the book on the left is Matthew's book, Matthew Brown who's the councillor I've been working with for so long, however long it is, nearly 10 years now. <clears throat> and the other one is, um, is the book I edited with a colleague, Phil Wyman. Uh, so um, if you like, Matthew, Matthew's book is a sort of uh, a practical guide to community wealth building. Uh, he, he takes us through uh, the nuts and bolts of community wealth building from a political and uh, councillor's perspective um, whereas the other the other book is if you like a wider ranging uh, more academic sort of book uh, thinking about Preston and community wealth building uh, in general and conceptualizing some of the ideas such as uh, you know what is a socio-economic democracy and so on and so forth so two different books which uh, together tell you 
pretty much everything you need to know about the press model. Um, I tried. I tried to look up a few things about Australia. Please forgive me. Uh, I'm very ignorant about Australia, uh, but I just uh, thought there is a couple of yeah, examples here, and of course, all of you will know much more than me. But you can see that um, there's community wealth building uh, maybe in the air, and um, my colleague uh, Tony Webster came in 2019 came to Australia and talked about the Preston model as well. And I'm just hoping that um, all of these things can be supportive for um, developments in Australia, which of course will be different. Australia, I, I've never been to Australia, but I imagine Australia is a very, very different place to uh, the UK and very different to uh, Preston. Um, what What is transferable from one to the other is not the uh, nuts and bolts of the model what's transferable is the principles and values so the principles and values which are basically based on the principles and values of cooperation those principles and values and some of the other ideas such as networking those things are transferable and then applicable to the circumstances and situations of different places so thank you for listening. There's a picture there of the docks in Preston. The docks in Preston used to be the biggest inland dock in Europe. Um, all of that is part of, part of the industrial past.